Okay, so thank you very much, Phil, for this kind uh, introduction. And let me thank the organizers, especially Lillian, Marina, and Phil for inviting me to give this talk. So it's a great pleasure to be in Bonn. Um, so uh, let me, um, so I would like to talk uh, about my um, joint work with uh, ben Krauser and Terry Tao about uh, pointwise ergodic theorems for bilinear polynomial averages. Mm. And so let me uh, so let me start with some simple um, uh, introduction to ergodic theory that will motivate um, our um, our uh, project. So, so let me start from the definition of a measure preserving system. So this is, so we'll consider a sigma finite measure space uh, X sigma algebra um, on X and uh, mu, this is a sigma finite um, measure. And this space will be equipped with a measure, measurable mapping T, which is measure preserving, which means that the following identity is satisfied for any measurable set. And from, the, from our point of view, uh, the most important uh, measure preserving system or dynamical system will be the um, integer shift system. So which is the set of integers with the sigma algebra of all subsets of Z counting measure and the shift operator, which is uh, S, of, S of X equal to X plus one, X plus one or X minus one. And so, so this, this will be the most important from the point of view of pointwise convergence. Uh, and another, uh, but in order to give you some idea about the measure preserving systems, so let me give another important example. So for instance, uh, the circle rotation system, this is the, which is important in the equidistribution theory, is the torus with the Lebesgue sigma algebra, Lebesgue measure, and the rotational map, uh, which is defined as x plus alpha modulo one, whenever alpha is an irrational number. Another important example in ergodic theory is the circle doubling system. So this is, in other words, uh, the multiplication by two on the torus, which is also equipped with the Lebesgue um, measure. And finally, an um, important system in, in number theory, this is the continued fraction system. This is the unit interval uh, with the Lebesgue sigma algebra and Gauss measure, which is defined as a Lebesgue measure with the following density, one, one over one plus x. And T, the, the, the measure preserving mapping, T is defined as one over X modulo one whenever X is, is non zero. And this, this mapping T of X <clears throat> allows us to recover the consecutive digits in the continued fraction expansion corresponding to a number X when we iterate uh, the, uh, this, this mapping T. And now an important and fundamental question in ergodic theory is the following. So can one, can one understand how points in measure preserving systems return close to themselves under iteration of the mapping T? And so an important tool to understand this problem are ergodic averages, which are defined in this form. Mm, that there are averages corresponding to the orbits T of N. And now we can observe that if we um, consider a characteristic function of a measurable set and uh, apply the averaging operator to this, uh, to, this, uh, to this characteristic function of E, then we see that the right-hand side represents the average number of visits of the set E by the orbit T and X. And now, if we want to understand the behavior of this quantity, we can use uh, norm or pointwise convergence for the averaging operators. And so, and if we use this, then we can 
uh, reproof, for instance, the famous Poincaré recurrence theorem, which says that if uh, we work with a probability measure preserving system and the measure of our set E is positive, then um, the orbit visits the set E infinitely many times. This can be deduced from this, uh, from this inequality. And so, and now in order to understand the asymptotic behavior of the averaging operators, so we will consider there are two types of convergence that are, uh, are important for, uh, for um, the periodic averages. Uh, so there is norm convergence and pointwise convergence, and the norm convergence in this kind of, for this kind of averages was <clears throat> established by von Neumann in 1931, and it says that for any square integrable function we have the convergence in norm for some function f f star. So this is the this is the first type of convergence, and the pointwise convergence essentially at the same time was established by Berkhoff. And here we know that for every function p between one and infinity, including one, we have the pointwise convergence for, um, <clears throat> for this averages. Okay, and now, so let me tell you a few words about how to establish the pointwise convergence in this, uh, in this, in the setup of um, Berkhoff averaging operators. So this can be done by proceedings in two steps. So in the first step, we can, uh, we have to establish a norm, that we have to establish LP boundedness for the maximal function corresponding to our averaging operator on LP uh, or for or weak type one one inequality when, whenever P is equal to one. And in the second step, we have to find the pointwise uh, we have to establish pointwise convergence on a dense class of functions in LP. So, and the first step can be accomplished by um, appealing to the Calderon transference principle and reducing the problem of establishing this inequality on arbitrary measurable measure preserving system to uh, the set of integers. So when whenever our average become uh, to be the average on, on the on the set of integers with the um, mm, shift operator t x equal to x minus one, and this is a very efficient way because uh, we can use some tools from um, Euclidean theory to, to 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 establish weak type one one or LP um, inequality. And now in the second step, in order to establish pointwise convergence on a dense class, we can uh, appeal to a trig of von Neumann and we can consider the space of all um, um, T invariant functions um, on L2. And now we see that if we restrict the, our averaging operator to the set I, then this is the identity operator. So therefore we have um, almost everywhere convergence in this, in this case. And now we have to understand the orthogonal complement on L2. Uh, and now one can see that the orthogonal complement um, to the space I, this is the <clears throat> L2 closure of the set G, of the set uh, J, uh, which is, uh, um, which consists of functions G, composed with T minus G whenever G is a bounded square integrable function. And now we can observe that if we apply our averaging operator to, um, if we apply our averaging operator to, um, to the function from the set G, then, um, uh, then we see that this, uh, this averaging operator telescopes. And only the first and the last term might survive. And now we see that as n goes to infinity, this quantity tends to zero. So therefore we have pointwise convergence almost everywhere on this space as well. And now using the fact that the algebraic sum i plus g, the closure, the L2 closure of this algebraic sum uh, gives us L2, then, then we are done. 
So that's the, this is how we, how we can prove um, the Barkov ergodic theorem. And um, now um, let me, uh, um, and now uh, um, this Barkov ergodic theorem can be generalized to some orbits taken uh, along um, polynomial mappings. And in the early uh, 1980s, Alessandra Bello and Harry Furstenberg asked independently about the pointwise convergence for the polynomial ergodic averages of this form. Whenever P is a polynomial with integer coefficients that vanishes at, um, at uh, zero. Uh, and um, Furstenberg was motivated by the following result from number theory of Sarkozy. So which states that if we consider a set with positive upper Banach density, which means that this um, limb soup is, is positive, then it turns out that there are integers x and n such that x comma x plus p of n are members of uh, the, set, the set S. And Furstenberg reduced this problem using the Furstenberg's correspondence principle to the polynomial version of Poincaré recurrence theorem, which asserts that if we have a polynomial as, as above and our measure preserving system is finite, and if we take any measurable sets with positive measure, then uh, we can find an integer n such that the measure of this set is um, non zero. And in fact, this happens infinitely many times. And this re recovers the Sarkozy theorem using ergodic theoretical approach. And Furstenberg obtained the, the, the latter um, inequality by showing, uh, by establishing the norm convergence for, the, um, for our polynomial uh, averages. But at the time, the, the question about the pointwise convergence was open until uh, the paper of Bourguin um, and Bourguin was able to, so uh, Bourguin was able to resolve this, this, this problem, but, um, and he was able to establish the pointwise convergence for the averaging operators along the polynomials. And although for Berkow's averaging operator, it was not difficult to find a dense class of functions as we have seen, for instance, on L2 for which we have pointwise convergence. For this kind of, operators, this is it, it's a much harder problem. And even for the squares, uh, it's not easy. And the reason is that if we take a look at the difference between n plus one square minus n square, then the difference is like two n plus one. And it's, um, it tends to infinity as n goes to infinity. So therefore we have unbounded gaps. And this telescoping argument that we have seen in the proof of Berkhoff's ergodic theorem doesn't work in this case. So that was the, that was the obstacle to, 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 to find a dense class for which we have pointwise convergence in the case of this kind of operators. And for overcoming this problem, Bourguin used the, the ideas from the circle method of Hardy and Littlewood. And he also used the two-step procedures. And first, in the first step, he established the LP boundedness of the maximal function for any P between one and infinity. And then in the second step, he was able to quantify the phenomenon of pointwise convergence for the, this kind of averages. And, and he was able to establish the following oscillation inequality that for any given lacunary sequence nj, he showed that there exists a constant such that for every j, the square function consisting of the mm, maximal mm, functions uh, corresponding to the set, uh, to the interval nj, nj plus one is controlled by j to power c times L to norm of f. And here it's important that this, he was able to do this for c, which is smaller than one half. And this inequality, uh, so, and, mm, and from this inequality, he was able to, to, to establish, um, to deduce pointwise, uh, convergence on, on, on L2. 
uh, okay, so this was this how it was done in the case of uh, how the pointwise convergence was established for the averaging operators along polynomials. But now I would like to um, mention about the uh, Samaritis theorem, um, so which says that if we um, if we have a set of integers which has positive upper density, which means that it satisfies this inequality. Then Semiredi was able to prove using some graph theoretic uh, tools that then for any k, there exists infinitely many progressions uh, in the set E. And the case k equal to the, prog of the progressions of length three was established in was established by by Klaus Roth in, in 1953 using some Fourier Fourier tools Fourier analytic uh, tools um, which are limited to the to the to the arithmetic progressions of length three. So and <clears throat> now this is the motivation to 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 study the multi um, linear averaging operators. But before I do this, let me mention the a result of Furstenberg, who um, reproved the uh, Samaritis, Samaritis theorem using ergodic uh, tools. So, and he was able to establish the um, analog, multiple analog of Poincare recurrence theorem. So, in particular, so he, he was able to show that um, for every uh, set E with positive measure and K, there exists N such that this inequality holds. And now combining this inequality with the first and first correspondence principle, he was able to recover some Redis theorem. So in fact, this multiple recurrence theorem was a consequence of a stronger result, uh, which uh, for which um, um, we uh, are able to understand the, the, the averaging operators, the lim inf corresponding to the averaging operators. And <clears throat> now the same kind of questions can be uh, studied in the context of polynomial um, patterns, polynomial um, uh, progressions. So, and now let me, uh, introduce the following set of, so let's consider the polynomials with integer coefficients and let's consider the averaging operator of this, of this form. We'll call this uh, operators non-conventional polynomial multiple ergodic averages. And this kind of averages are useful in detecting polynomial patterns using, uh, by proving a, a, a counterpart of um, uh, multiple recurrence results. So, and uh, in fact, um, this was um, done by Bergelson and Liebman um, at the early 1990s, who was able to show that if we have, was able, they were able to deduce that if we have a set with non-vanishing, set of integers with non-vanishing Banach density, then uh, these sets must contain polynomial patterns of this form. Mm, and they were able, they were able to, to obtain this result, to deduce this result from by establishing the following analog of Furstenberg um, result uh, with the polynomial orbits. And <clears throat> so, but now in order to understand the behavior, limiting behavior of the um, averaging operators along polynomials, so here we can consider the following the following questions. So norm convergence, almost everywhere convergence, and which can be used to, 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 deduce, uh, to deduce the um, recurrence theorem. But in order to establish almost everywhere convergence, we have to understand the maximal inequality, but being in the context of polynomials, it's, more convenient to, to, to try to understand the variational inequality because we don't have simple, there is no simple way to establish the pointwise convergence on, the, on a dense class, even though 
some maximal inequality can be not difficult to, to prove in the multilinear setup by appealing to the linear theory. Okay, and now let me recall the definition of the um, R variational semi norm. So, so the R variational semi norm can be defined um, in this way. So, this is the quantity of this form. For any complex valued functions, we can see their small LR norm corresponding to the consecutive di differences associated with a finite increasing sequence. And we take here the soup over all finite increasing sequences. And the nice advantage of um, um, our variations is that if this is finite, then this implies that the underlying sequence must be a Cauchy sequence. And so therefore the pointwise convergence can be, can be established in one step. But of course we have to pay some price for this because the R variational uh, norm is larger than, than the, the, the maximal, hmm. uh, maximal norm. So, hmm. and now, but also our variational semi-norm, it gives us some quantitative information about the pointwise convergence. And in order to understand this, we have to introduce the um, definition of lambda jump counting function, which is even more fundamental object. Uh, so this is the this is the number of of, of uh, this is the length of a sequence uh, where the difference between two consecutive terms is bigger than lambda. So and now we see that if this is uh, if this quantity um, is finite, uh, then we have. Um, then we can also recover the pointwise convergence. And here we have the natural relation between um, lambda jumps and R variations. So we can see that we have, so first of all, it's, it's, not, it's uh, not difficult to see that we have the, the following pointwise bound between R variations and lambda jumps. And now we see that if, um, if this quantity is, is finite, then we see that the number of jumps cannot exceed some multiple constant divided by lambda to power r. So therefore, when lambda is small, smaller than one, then we get a quantitative information about the convergence of the underlying sequence. So that's the, and that's the uh, important benefit of studying um, the R variations and lambda jumps. And now let me tell you, a few words about the current state of the art concerning the limiting behavior of the multiple averaging operators. So in 1977, Fustenberg established um, the uh, um, norm convergence for this uh, averaging operators in L2 in the case of, uh, in the bilinear case for linear polynomials, whenever P1 is equal A n and P2 is equal B n for A and B uh, for integers A and B. Okay. And in 1996, Furstenberg and Weiss extended uh, this result and they showed that the norm convergence uh, holds in the trilinear setup for linear polynomials. And they also were able to establish the norm convergence in the bilinear setting for the polynomials P1n and P2 equal uh, n square. And this result <clears throat> uh, in 2002, Host and Kra and independently Tamar Ziegler in 2004 established norm, conver norm convergence for the multiple averaging operators in the case of all, um, in the case of linear uh, polynomials. And their results was their results were uh, extended by Liebman in 2005, and the norm convergence was established for averaging operators and arbitrary polynomials. And this is essentially um, uh, the progress that um, had been made uh, over the years concerning the norm convergence, but. Uh, 
what is important from, 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 from our point of view is that in 1990, Bourdain also was able to establish pointwise convergence for the bilinear averaging operators whenever, in the case of linear orbits, whenever P1 is equal to IN and P2 is equal to BN, whenever I and B are, are integers. And, uh, okay, and now let me also mention about uh, an important result, a dramatic extension of the Furstenberg and Weiss uh, result, as well as uh, Horst Kra and Ziegler and Leibmann, which was done by Miguel Walsh in 2012. And he was he showed that if if G is an important group of a measure preserving transformations in a probability space, then for every polynomials with integer coefficients and for every measure preserving transformations from this nilpotent group, the following ergodic averaging operators converge in L2 norm whenever n goes to infinity for every bounded functions. So and uh, now this is important result because it motivates the following. Um, now we know, uh, so the, the result of, of, of Walsh, um, uh, gives a complete um, characterization of the norm convergence in the class of all multiple averaging operators. But now um, there is a, question about the pointwise convergence uh, for this class of averaging operators. And one of the central open problems in pointwise ergodic theory, this is a conjecture of Bergelson, which was formulated in the late 80s or early 90s. And it can be formulated as follows. So if G is an important group of a measure preserving transformation of probability space X, and we have polynomials with integer coefficients, then Mm, there is a question uh, if the averaging operators of this form converge me almost everywhere as n goes to infinity. And this word was <clears throat> what is important, what was observed by Bergelson and Leibman, so that the, for instance, the L2 norm convergence for, for this kind of averaging operators so may fail if G is a solvable group. So if we go beyond the class of nilpotent groups, then this, this theorem can be, uh, cannot be true. And um, moreover, if, uh, so therefore this uh, suggests that the nilpotent setting is probably the most general setting where Bergelson's question about pointwise convergence for uh, this multiple averaging operators may be true. And okay, so and now let me tell you uh, what is known about the pointwise convergence in the in the linear set setting, and that uh, which uh, contributes somehow to understanding of the Bergelson's conjecture. So, if we consider the averaging operators of this form, and <clears throat> um, so, so we assume that we have a sigma finite measure space with a family of invertible. Here we assume that commuting measure preserving transformations, and we consider the polynomial mapping, and we define the averaging operators of this form. So here, the summation is taken, can be even taken over some multidimensional um, convex body. So in this case, we can think that this is the discrete Euclidean ball. Then one is able to establish the pointwise convergence for this kind of averaging operators. And in the sharpest possible mm, mm, setup. So uh, in other words, we can, we can, first of all, we can establish the R variational estimates for any R bigger than, than two and any P bigger than, than one. So we have the following inequality. And we know that whenever R is equal to, then this result is, is sharp. So the left-hand side of this inequality exposed. But we have some endpoint estimates in the form of the um, lambda jump inequality. So, and this, this inequality is, is, is the best possible in the, in the context of, the, of quantifying pointwise convergence phenomena. So, and in particular, these two inequalities, they imply pointwise 
convergence be almost everywhere, so as well as LP norm convergence in this in this setup. Um, okay, so and now let me tell you about some recent project with Alex Unesco, Akos Mager, and Tomek Sharag. And we were able recently to prove the following result, that if we take a sigma finite measure space, and we assume that uh, we have a family of invertible and measure preserving transformation, where, which satisfy the following commutator rela relation. And then for every polynomials and for every function in LP, the averages of this form, converge me almost everywhere in LP um, and as well as in, in, in NOR as N goes to um, infinity. So here one can think that this measure preserving transformations belong to a nilpotent group of step two of a measure preserving mapping of a sigma finite measure space X. And so, but this works so far we have these results for the nilpotent group of step two. And now we are working also on the extension of these results to the nilpotent group of step three. And, and higher. And so this paper will be available in, in a few weeks on, on, on archive. So it's, it's essentially done. Um, so, so this also gives uh, some contribution to the Bergelson's conjecture in the, in the, in the non-commutative setup. But finally, uh, let me also mention about the contribution to the Bergelson's conjecture um, from the point of view of the multilinear setup. So a, a year ago, uh, ben Krause, Terry Tao, and myself, who established the following results. So we are able to um, establish the pointwise convergence for the averaging operator, bilinear averaging operators of, of, of this form. Whenever first polynomial is linear and the second polynomial is, uh, is, a, is a polynomial, second, second orbit is taken along polynomial with degree bigger or equal to. And in this context, we were able to establish the long variational um, inequality uh, for all functions f in LP1 and g in LP2, whenever one over P1 and one over P2 satisfies the, the, the Helder equation. And um, so in particular, the, this, the variational inequality since it's established for all lacunary sequences, it implies the pointwise convergence for this kind of uh, averaging operators. And uh, okay, so now let me tell you uh, a few words about the uh, about the proof of this uh, of this uh, theorem. Sorry. So in the classical setup, in the linear theory. Um, so here, in order to understand this kind of averaging operators along, along polynomial orbits, it's good to um, implement the ideas from the circle method. This is very efficient. It allows us to understand the multiplier corresponding to our averaging operators whenever the frequency vectors, the frequencies are <clears throat> restricted to the minor arcs so where it's expected that the behavior of the <clears throat> corresponding multiplier will be highly oscillatory or to the major arcs where we expect that the multiplier operator will be, will, will be able to, to understand the asymptotic behavior of, of, um, of the corresponding multiplier. And in the linear theory, the case of the minor arcs uh, follows from <clears throat> from the Plancherel's theory, theorem and Weiss inequality, at least for uh, whenever we are concerned the L2 theory. And so Weiss inequality says that, <clears throat> so it, it allows us to provide some estimates for the normalized exponential sum in terms of N <clears throat> and <clears throat> number Q, which is, <clears throat> I'm sorry, <clears throat> which is, the rational approximation of the leading coefficients of the um, polynomial from the, uh, from the phase of, of our exponential sum. And here we know that we can control this exponential sum by the following quantity. And this, is, this, uh, this estimate is uniform in N and Q. 
And in the bilinear theory, in the multilinear theory, Vals inequality is inefficient. And also uh, inability to appeal to the to Plancher's theorem forced us to, to proceed differently. And so in the case of our bilinear problem, we were able to prove the following counterpart of Vals inequality, which has which can be formulated um, in the following way. So if we have so suppose that we have a polynomial with, uh, as, as before with uh, integer coefficients and this polynomial has degree bigger than two and let uh, the set M, L, K be the family of major arcs corresponding to some family of rational fractions. So, and now we can say that if we have function f and g, which are square integrable, and either the Fourier transform of f vanishes on minor, vanishes on major arcs, or the Fourier transform of g vanishes of the corresponding major arcs. So here d corresponds to the degree of, of polynomial p. Then we have the following, Mm, then we can show that our bilinear averaging operator on L1 is highly oscillatory. And highly oscillatory, which means that this is ex exhibited in this, this uh, factor uh, k here with this decay in k. And uh, so, <clears throat> and let me tell you how we, uh, how we prove this theorem. So, so this, this theorem is the core of, of our argument and its proof is uh, quite complicated and relies on several deep results uh, in the literature and including the unesco wenger multiplier theory, which now can be thought as a discrete with wood theory. And an, the key thing was the inverse theory of Pelus and Prendigil from additive combinatorics. I will say a few words about this theorem in, in the next slide. And we also, had to use the Han Banach separation theorem to say something about the to, to, to provide some structural description of this of this of, of this bilinear averaging operators whenever f and g are restricted to the to the minor arcs. And we also had to appeal to the LP improving estimates of Han, Kovach, Lacey, Madrid, and Young, which can be derived from the <clears throat> Vinogradov's mean value theory. And now let me formulate the uh, theorem of, uh, of Pelous. And so, so the, as I said, the, the most imp important ingredient um, of our, of in, in our proof that was the, that was the Pelous theory. Uh, and this can be thought as a counterpart of Weiss inequality, but uh, <clears throat> so, and this theorem, this is some structural theorem, which says that if we have polynomials with, um, integer coefficients and all they have distinct degrees. And if we consider uh, at infinity functions that are supported on some interval minus n node, n node, whenever n node corresponds to n to power the degree of p1. And if the average corresponding to, uh, if, if the L1 norm corresponding to our uh, multiple average is large in terms of these two numbers, then we can deduce that the average of the first function f1 restricted to some subprogressions must be also large. And here, by restricting to the subprogression, so we so so we can deduce that there are some numbers q and n prime. Q is not large in terms of the parameter delta, and n prime is, is comparable with the <clears throat> with the uh, scale of function f1, so that this average is, is large. And here it's what is important that uh, this, this number here, this dependence on delta uh, in the conclusion uh, is, is polynomial. So this is, this is, that was extremely, uh, that was extremely useful in our, in our approach because it nicely fits to the UNESCO Wenger and multiplier theorem. And <clears throat> so before the theory of, uh, before the theorem of Palouse and Prendiville, uh, this kind of estimates were, were impossible. And the polynomial dependence 
on Delta here was completely out of, out of reach. So that that this this theorem is a huge breakthrough in the in in additive combinatorics. And let me mention why. So because this is um, uh, this so th this this inverse theorem arises as as a um, arises from uh, the problem of quantifying <clears throat> the behavior of function R p1 pm, which denotes the size of the largest subset of integers between 1 and n, containing no configuration of this form. And Bergelson and Liebman, as, as, we, as I mentioned um, at the beginning, showed um, proving the polynomial multiple recurrence theorem that this, this quantity it behaves like small o of n for all polynomials with um, Mm, integer coefficients. And uh, of course, mm, uh, but Bergson and Lima theorem doesn't say anything, doesn't say mm, anything quantitatively about the behavior of, of, of this function. And mm, but we know from the linear theory and due to uh, the celebrated works of Gowers that um, uh, uh, it's possible to quantify this this function in the case of the linear uh, polynomials by introducing the machinery of higher order Fourier analysis, the Gowers norms, and etc. And there was a natural question: What happens in the case of the polynomial progressions? And um, that was the question of, of, of Gowers. And uh, Calus and Prendeville were able to uh, give a positive answer to quantify the behavior of, um, of, of this function uh, by building this theory, this, the, the inverse theorem that I mentioned on the, on the previous, previous slide. And Pelouse, uh, in the general case, she was able to show that this function corresponding to the Polynomial um, to the polynomial progressions where all polynomials have distinct degrees behaves like uh, like this, and she answer positive. She answer a, a question of uh, of, of Gauss. and so so and this uh, so and as I said, so the in, this inverse theorem was uh, important in uh, in our. Um, our work in establishing the uh, counterpart of vice inequality in the bilinear setup. And um, um, now let me tell you uh, what happens in the on the on the my on the major arcs for the for our bilinear operating operators. So in the linear setup. One can use the circle the ideas from the circle method and the unesco wenger multiplier theorem to deduce a linear analog of this of this inequality whenever function f and g are restricted on the Fourier transform side to the to the major arcs. But here the the situation is is much more complicated, and the, the reason is that we so the Planchard theorem, because we work on L1, the Planchard theorem is, is, is very inefficient here. And um, so, but the, 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 the idea, the key idea is based, is based on the following factorization. So here uh, we, at some point observe that there is some hope to factorize this maximal function and replace the, the, the bilinear maximal function by the product of maximal function corresponding to the, to the um, linear averages. So in other words, we see that if we take G equal one, then this is, this this fir the first function will correspond to, to the um, uh, hardy litwood maximal operator. And if we take F, equal one, then the second one will correspond to the Burgeon's averaging operator along, along P of n. And this idea turned out to be, to be efficient, but, uh, and once we have this, then, then now we can apply uh, Cauchy-Schwarz inequality and, 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 and this inequality can be derived from the, from the linear theory. But the, the whole difficulty lies in establishing this factorization. And the proof of this inequality is a combination of some 
some sophisticated tools from Fourier analysis and additive combinatorics. And again, here we use the inverse theory of Peluz and Prendiville. And we also had to use some kind of rademacher menshoff argument combined with Kinchin's inequality and LP bounds for a shifted square function, unesco wenger multiplier theory, which as I said before, gives rise to the discrete little Pelly theory, as well as some discrete counterpart of, um, of the theory of para products. We also use some bounded entropy argument, entropy argument from Banach space theory. And finally, we had to understand the behavior of this bilinear averaging operator in the model case, which in our situation is the, the, the periodic case. So in other words, when, when everything is, is defined in the periodic fields and there we had to establish some van der Korput type estimates and some sort and derive from them some kind of LP um, improving inequalities. So, and this is, this is what was used to, to, to establish this, this inequality, to, 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 to make this factorization rigorous. Uh, okay, so and this is how the uh, so how the this is this is this this give us some some idea about the about the proof and the tools that that we had to use. And now I would like to mention about uh, about some some um, ongoing uh, work. So at this moment, uh, I'm working with Ben Krause, Sarah Pelouz, and Jim Wright on upgrading our convergence results to the higher degrees of the multilinearity. And now we expect uh, to prove the, the following results, that for every k bigger or equal to, and for all polynomials with uh, integer coefficients and distinct degrees, and all bounded functions, we expect to establish the pointwise convergence for the, for the multiple Mm, averaging operators. But here, uh, at this moment, since we also are working, we are upgrading the, 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 the theory of, of Palouse and Prendiville to the multilinear setup. So we also expect that the assumption about the distinct degrees will be, uh, will be, the, will be critical here. So, and, and there, is, there is some hope um, that this, this kind of result is, um, is true. And our ultimate goal would be to, uh, we also think about, about uh, extending this, uh, uh, this, this theorem and, uh, about um, establishing this theorem for the commuting invertible measure preserving transformations. So in other words, instead of single transformations, we would like to understand the situation when we have uh, when we have commuting um, transformations here. And all polynomials here are also, uh, have also distinct degrees. And so the conjecture of Bergelson in particular says that this kind of averages converge me almost everywhere as well. And this is a very hard problem, uh, definitely much harder than, than the one with the, with the single transformation. However, we have some promising thoughts about the averaging operators for two commuting transformations. Whenever orbits are, are taken, first orbit is taken along n and the second along n square. And this kind of averaging operators corresponds to the configurations, to the corner configurations, x comma y, x plus n comma y, x comma n plus n square. And in this setup, we can at least establish um, the estimates for the minor arc by upgrading the theory of Pelus and Prendiville to the to the case of the of the corners. So this, uh, uh, in particular, um, handles the case of the minor arc estimates. And using the minor arc estimates, we can also go a little bit further and establish some maximal inequalities in the case of of the small scales on the. Uh, whenever a function f and g correspond to the um, to the major arcs, and this is uh, but not and now not now the whole difficulty lies in the in 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 um, uh, understanding the the large scales. And in the linear theory, the case of the large scales was fairly easy because we have a beautiful result sampling or transference principle due to Magyar, Stein, and Wenger. 
and everything from the discrete setup can be trans can be transferred to the continuous and estimates in this regime can be can be deduced from the from the continuous setup here in the bilinear multilinear theory this is much more complicated and 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 uh, at this moment we we are able to 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 handle the small scales which were very difficult in the linear theory but now it turns out that the, the machinery that was built in linear theory is quite robust and and we can we can implement some ideas from the linear theory to and extend to the multilinear setup and now the question is about uh, how to understand the situation for the for the large case and now we, we think about about this this kind of things okay so this is my this is my last slide thank you very much for for your attention